thank you all for joining today. Um, I am Lindsay Kelly. Uh, we are um, here for my thesis defense on the effect of parcel erosion information and peer comparisons on rural landowners' willingness to invest in stream restoration. So the plan for our presentation goes like this. Um, we'll have our introduction and background, a conceptual framework and hy my hypotheses, the experimental design and some deviations, then the field experiment landowner pilot models and results, and then the lab virtual experiment student uh, models and results, and then the conclusions. And we'll start here. So water bodies all over the United States are struggling to reach water quality goals. Uh, the decline in water quality is due both to point source and non-point sources of pollution, um, of sediment and nutrient pollution. Legacy sediments from previous land management choices have also affected um, the impact of conservation programs that have aimed at helping water quality. And really the problem is on land, these sediments and nutrients are really helpful to farmers and crops, but when it rains or like um, floods or dams breach, like those would be the legacy sediment options, a huge amounts of these sediments and nutrients get released into the water and also those mill dams, when they breach, they destroy the stream banks around them, um, which also releases even more sediments and uh, nutrient pollution into the water. Increasing levels of sediment and nutrients also accelerate the growth of algae. Um, this is a picture of that algae. <clears throat> it, you can see it's kind of got this bluish green uh, uh, hue to the top of it and those would be like harmful algal blooms that are caused basically fueled by the phosphorus um, and nitrogen that gets released into the water. Uh, because they cannot force contributions to non-point sources of pollution, the government has to turn to voluntary contribution strategies. And this is because point source pollution, we know where it's coming from, we know how much is coming from it, and we can say, hey, you really need to you know, reduce your amount of pollution by this amount um, because we have proof that it's coming from you. Non-point sources are a lot harder. You can't really say, um, well, we have this exact amount of sediment coming from this exact address and we need this particular person or group of people uh, to reduce that pollution. So we have to rely on these voluntary strategies. Um, so there has been uh, extensive literature in other types of environmental problems such as energy conservation, um, also water conservation, not necessarily contributions to stream bank restoration, but the idea is that they use social norms and different types of framing to create these types of low cost interventions that promote people to want to uh, contribute to these public good types of things. So one example, in Alcott 2011, they use peer comparisons to reduce residential energy consumption. And they use a social norming message that we actually pull from kind of for our study, which is here. And it says last month, you use 15% less electricity than your efficient neighbors. So we do use a very similar message to that in one of our treatments. Um, they've also included some smiley faces and they clearly compare um, the all neighbors, efficient neighbors, and then your parcel. So the goal of this research is to measure the effect of parcel level erosion information on rural landers, landowners' willingness to invest in stream bank restoration projects, given one of these four information treatments. Uh, so far, no other study has done this to our knowledge. So how we are going to do this, um, will be outlined in our conceptual framework <laughs> and my hypotheses. So we have these contemporary and legacy sources of non-point pollution, non-point source pollution. Um, and that's our red circle here. And so this is where we're gonna start in this framework. Um, these non-point sources are directly a result of and directly impacted by private land management decisions. 
um, these land management decisions uh, will either reduce or not reduce non-point source pollution. Um, and so they will either contribute or not contribute to the abatement in watersheds. Um, and so that will either improve or not improve the water quality. Where we come in is we wanna see if this feedback loop actually exists, um, if there is any effect. Uh, so the light blue arrows go from the sediment and nutrient pollution abatement back over to peer comparisons and erosion information. And this is because we have to use the current amounts um, to inform the peer comparison as well as the erosion information. And so when that is fed back to the private landowners, they can make decisions about their non-point source abatement and see if it goes back around and around. Um, so that is how we conceptualize our study. And the way we're going to test it is through these four hypotheses. And I've chosen to state these hypotheses as null hypotheses because um, for the landowner pilot, we did not get significant directional hypotheses when we did two treatments and now we have four. Uh, so I thought I would just state them all as null to play it safe. Um, our first hypothesis is information given to participants that compares them to their peers will not have a measurable effect on landowner investments to stream restoration. Second, information given to participants in the form of parcel specific erosion rates will not have a measurable effect on landowner investments to stream restoration. Third, information given to participants in the form of parcel specific erosion rates with peer comparison information will not have a measurable effect on landowner investments to stream restoration. And these three treatments um, have contemporary sources as the cause of erosion. Um, and then hypothesis four is the same as three, but instead of contemporary sources, uh, we say it's legacy sources of pollution. So how do we actually test this? we can look at the experimental design. Uh, so here is the treatment table that was built after the uh, 2018 landowner field experiment pilot. This was going to be used with the landowners in Delaware, but <laughs> that was all canceled. So we ended up using the five um, groups with the students. So I also, um, have the landowner pilot treatments, like where they fall in. So obviously there's a control. We have um, information about parcel level erosion and peer comparison. And then they also had T5, uh, which was information about parcel level erosion with the legacy cause. Um, so that would be the treatment table for the landowner pilot. And then this is like our, our current moving forward treatment table with our parcel specific erosion information and our peer comparison information. So as Leah mentioned in the beginning, um, we started with a landowner pilot and then we were gonna move right into landowner field experiments, like a full, full experimental sessions. Uh, we were unable to do that because of COVID. So we had to do a full 180 and figure out how to get, how to use this, um, treatment, this two by two treatment design um, with our new <laughs> new participants who were going to have to be students at this point, but that's okay. Um, it was completely appropriate to use students for this um, project because once we get the landowner data, we will actually be able to compare the student data, how students react to this information as we compare it to the way landowners react to this exact same information. They will be um, the same study. So participants um, were given part one general instructions. Uh, their endowment was land uh, earnings in project bucks. So we estimated that maybe they would earn 50,000 um, project bucks from their land parcel per round. There were 10 rounds total. The first two rounds were practice rounds uh, and the following eight rounds were actual decision rounds. Their earnings were not dependent on the decisions of their group members. 
and the contributions they created for charity uh, were dependent on the decisions of the group. And so we used charitable contributions to represent um, what actual real US dollar contributions to charity would be if they were actually owning land and actually contributed to stream restoration. Uh, these contributions did go to a real um, restoration project. And um, then they were given part two. Uh, they had the practice round instructions that informed um, them that the practice rounds didn't count on either their earnings or their charitable contributions. Uh, part three was the eight rounds that do affect the earnings and charitable contributions. Uh, landowners used iPads in their field experiment uh, while students were using their own computers with the same SOFI program, um, but it was virtual. And I have a little screenshot here of what the beginning of our practice looks like for our SOFI program. So it was very um, easy to navigate, just continue buttons, and then you enter one decision per each of the eight rounds. So we made it a little bit more complicated than just saying $50,000 and then um, that's, what you, that's what you get at the end. So we made it project bucks. Um, the way to reduce erosion was that for every 5,000 project bucks invested in the stream restoration, 5% was donated to, or was uh, made into chair, 5% uh, was the erosion reduction. Um, for each ton of erosion reduced on the parcel, 500 project bucks would be donated to a stream restoration project. Their earnings were their $50,000 minus their contribution to restoration divided by their conversion rate, which were different for the landowners and the students. Um, for landowners, we said that 5,000 project bucks would equal one US dollar. And for students, we made that 20,000 project bucks um, equals one US dollar. And we did this so it, may, it was more salient um, to the students uh, after we had already design the landowner study, but also we don't pay the students as much. Landowners also got a $50 show up fee, whereas students got a $10 show up fee. So participants actually saw real maps of real parcels, and these are actually Pennsylvania parcels, but um, for our control group, they got a blank map, the, uh, if you look closely, you can see a blue stream that runs through the middle. This is just uh, one example of the maps. We did have 10 different maps, um, 10 different landscapes. So they were told soil erosion comes from the bank of the stream and current land uses cause that. And they were asked to make a contribution decision. Treatment two, they had that same first message, but then they also got this second norming statement saying, hey, Here's your blank map with your stream. In a typical year though, your erosion rate is greater than or less than or about the same as the typical erosion rate of 160 tons per year. And that 160 tons per year uh, was based off of a real EPA um, target goal of 20% for the Chesapeake Bay, 20% uh, erosion, 20% pollution reduction um, for the EPA. So we took that number and we got 160 um, tons per year for our, our uh, average erosion rate. For treatment three, they had the same first statement, but their second statement changed. They were just given the actual erosion number and then shown where the erosion was actually happening on their stream. So you can see there's some dark red, some orange, some yellow spots along their stream, and then they were given a number. Um, and our range was three tons per year to 1640 tons per year. Um, and we had 10 different numbers. So they had one of, one of those in their rotation. For treatment four, they also had that first same statement, and then they had both of the new statements, which was the norming statement saying about the same as, less than, greater than, um, and then also the number of 
erosion tons per year, which, and then they also got the map with the um, erosion shown on that as well. For treatment five, they had three new, so th the same two as treatment four on the bottom, but then they're also told about the legacy land um, uses caused the erosion and not the contemporary sources. So after they get all that, what does that mean? How do we test that? So I created some random effects models because we have panel data and this model also contains error terms that control for individual and individual round effects. I use clustered standard errors because they allow for the program uh, to make as little assumptions as possible. So for model A1, my dependent variable is investment and we have IJ. Our first beta one is our treatment two, which was our um, peer comparison and erosion with uh, contemporary causes. And then treatment two, which was our um, uh, erosion information, peer comparison and legacy causes. So we, then I included um, round female and age. So for model A2, which is the same model, but I've also created a new variable called high erosion. And this just takes the um, erosion parcels over 160 tons annually and sees what those parcels contribute. And then I created interaction terms between the high erosion and then both of the treatments and then included round female in age afterwards. So for the landowner pilot, uh, we had 31 participants with us that day. Um, their mean age was 53, point, so 54. Um, and most of them were male. Uh, their average contributions by their treatments was the control contributed 26,000 project bucks. Um, treatment two or the contemporary causes with erosion and peer comparison um, was 24,000 project bucks and treatment three with the legacy causes was on average um, 24,000 project books also. So model A1, which I have better explained my variables here, we don't actually have anything significant, um, but that's okay because model A2, oops, wrong way, sorry, gets way more fun. And we have actual results here. Um, so both treatments two and three become significant, but also our um, interaction terms are both highly significant, meaning they are significant below the 1% level. Um, so when people, or for our landowners specifically, were given a higher erosion rate than their average, they contributed um, significantly more than people who either had an average erosion rate or a lower than average erosion rate on their land parcel. It's not originally what we were testing for, but it's definitely a very interesting um, result that can be applied to uh, real world. So how did the students compare to this? Well, the student models were, were built in a very similar way both random effects models and both with clustered standard errors. Um, we have the same dependent variable of investment and we have the four treatments this time on our beta zero and we have round female and age again. Similarly, in model B2, we have our new interaction term for high erosion and we, I'm sorry, our new variable high erosion and then we create our interaction terms for each of the treatments with the high erosion as well. We also include round female and age. So for students, their average age was 22. Makes sense. Um, majority were female for our students, which was the opposite of our landowners. Um, the mean contributions for the treatments were varied. Um, for our control group, there was 11,700 um, for their average contribution. For the peer comparison only, 21.2 thousand. 
um, we have for the erosion only 15,000 for the erosion information peer comparison with the contemporary cause 9,722 and for the legacy cause with the erosion information and the peer comparison 12,700. Uh, also, you'll notice the maximum for treatment one was 40,000, so nobody contributed the full amount for treatment one. Interesting. So for our student pilot results, this is the model I use to, to um, inform my hypothesis table and my conclusions. And I chose to do this because this was the model I had planned in my head before I started the research, so I didn't I didn't actually plan to um, look at the high erosion parcels until we found those interesting through the pilot. So I wanted to be like very clear, this was what I was testing originally and this informs my conclusion table. So I actually only found that the peer comparison treatment was statistically significant um, for this model um, and then for my conclusions as well. But when we add in, our um, model B2 and we have our high erosion variable. Now we have a lot more significance. Um, we see treatment two, treatment four, and then all four of the treatments are significant when you look at their high erosion parcels. So for both the landowners and the students, when you isolate the high erosion parcels with the treatments, they are statistically significant across the board. So what does this mean? Well, for my conclusion tables, I can reject my null hypothesis for information given to participants that compares them to their peers will not have a measurable effect on landowner investments to stream restoration because in my model B1, it did have a statistically significant effect. However, the other three treatments did not. So this is how I chose to present my table. Uh, what this means is that these findings suggest landowners with higher than average erosion parcels are the ones we definitely want to target if we are trying to get them to voluntarily contribute to these programs. Um, and that's true, I mean, for the farmers, the landowners, and the students both. Um, also, information given to participants in the form of parcel-specific erosion rates um, with peer comparison information does have a measurable effect on landowner investments to stream restoration, but it didn't with students. Um, and participants, both landowners and students, did not invest more or less when they were informed that the cause of erosion was from legacy causes. Um, we did notice that there were boomerang effects when people had lower than average erosion rates, they would contribute less than they had been before if um, they were told that they contribute or they had a lower red erosion rate than their neighbors. Um, so that would definitely be something you would want to keep in mind if you were informing a policymaker about how to use this information effectively. Um, and lastly, some limitations of this study that I was aware of um, is that we had a small number of high erosion parcels. Um, I think only two or three out of our 10. So I think our results could be different if we had um, maybe 20 parcels and more of them were high erosion than just the couple that we had. So I think we should definitely, when we do this in the future, be able to include more variations of parcels and parcel sizes. Um, and like I mentioned before, we did see the boomerang effects with the low erosion parcels. So it may be better not to inform people if they have a low erosion parcel that they have a low erosion parcel. And it may be best to target the high erosion parcels um, because the erosion is happening regardless of whether they know it or not. So we should really be um, targeting those high erosion parcels and letting them know. Um, and that will be our next step, would be once COVID is no longer a threat, uh, we will be running our full landowner sessions. I will just hopefully no longer be a student. Um, and uh, we will be running it with the five uh, groups and full session. And hopefully that will give us the next set of results that we can compare to our students.
Thank you.